Hello, and welcome to our Surge Experience Online. It is a joy to have you join us today and an honor to share our ministry with you. We pray you will be blessed by the worship, the message, and the ministry. If you are new to Surge, we want to welcome you. Please log on to our website at surgechurch.tv and complete the online connect card that you will find on the main graphic of the homepage. It will be a privilege to connect with you and to be a part of your spiritual growth. As we gather together today, let's join in worship, receive God's word in faith, and stay connected in spirit. Get ready because the Surge Experience starts now.
continue our worship with our giving. I need someone to say amen or someone get excited about it. We should be so excited. We should be raising our hands. We should be excited because this is the opportunity we have to give. This is the opportunity. So many of you guys know me, know that I'm a who, what, when, where kind of guy. Right, left, up, down, black, white. I don't have no in-betweens. It's okay. That's who I am. But, you know, I focus on giving. And I was thinking about it. I was like, what about the when? All right? The, the who, the what, the why. It's pretty self-explanatory. But the when. So I come up with a statement that says, when we give, we become like Christ. I'm going to say that again. Like, when we give, we become like Christ. And I, and I found a scripture to back this up. And in Acts 20, 35, it says, in everything I did, I showed you that be kind and hard work. We must help the weak. Remembering the words of Lord Jesus himself, he said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. All right? It's tempting to always look at, you know, if I'm talking to the business guys, you know, the ROI or the return on investment. It's hard sometimes. You know, you say, hey, I give this. Where's my return? That's, that's, that's business. If you have business in your mind, you think that every time. Hey, if I give someone this, what's my return on my investment? All right, that's in your brain. Sometimes it's hard to get rid of that. You know, it's, it's, it's not, nothing wrong with that. But because we, we must do excellent, we must be excellent stewards of God's money. And we got to know that, hey, that's God's money. When you get paid on Friday, that's God's money. Yeah, you worked, but he, he gave it to you. Uh, he gave you that job. He is the way maker. He made a way for that job. Uh, he promised to us and says, hey, I'll provide for you. All right? He did that for us. So it's his. But sometimes generosity is more about what God's doing through your giving, not what you're giving it for. We get stuck sometimes like, I'm not giving because I don't see things being done. Or, oh, I'm not going to do that because I, you know, I don't see this. Or, I don't like this. Or, no, it's not about what's going to happen. It's about giving what is God's going to do through your giving. Because we're giving, we're giving to Him. We're giving to God. That's what we're doing, right? So we have an opportunity right now. Right now in this service. This is what I'm talking about the win. We have an opportunity to do it right now. To... I just challenge you guys to, again, believe in the promise of Jesus. That was a promise in Jesus in Acts 20, uh, 35. It says, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. That's a promise. And we know he's a promise keeper. He can't lie. So if he says that we're more blessed to give than it is to receive, why do we have a problem giving? That's a good question, right? You should want to give all the time. You should find opportunities to give all the time, wherever you go. Find an opportunity to give. Here's one opportunity right now. We're, we're, I'm going to get the ushers to come up front for me, please, at, at this time. But, you know, it's more blessed to give than it's received. So just join me in trusting the promise of our God. Our God tells us it's, it's more blessed to give. So I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then they're going to pass the buckets out. And those of you online, there's many ways to give here. You can give online through the, uh, through the church app or online. Uh, we got a, a, you know, in the four you can give there. Or you have an envelope in front of you, you can fill it out. Uh, and, and put it in the envelope uh, or put it in the buckets when they can come to you. So we're going to pray, guys. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come to your house. Lord, we just thank you for who you are, and we know that you are who you say you are. You are the promise keeper. Lord, we hold on to your promises right now. We know that you say it's more blessed to give than it is to receive, and we're going to, Lord, we ask you to touch our hearts now as we give to you. Lord, I ask you for blessings beyond our beliefs, beyond our understanding. Lord, I ask you that you touch our gift to you, Lord. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys as you give. Well, good morning. God bless you. It's such a joy to see you today. How many people are being blessed? You're excited to be at church today. Come on. You're excited to be at church. Come on. Hey, I just want to get right into the word this morning. We're, we're continuing a series titled Treasure, a Biblical Perspective on Money. Treasure, a Biblical Perspective on Money. And so I want to encourage you not to get weird because I said money in church and we're talking about money right after we receive the offering. You know, we as a church, we have to talk about all kinds of things. You know, we talk about families. We talk about marriage. We just talked about, we did a week, a, a four-week message on healing. Come on, praise God. This week, Mikhail sent me a message. I was out of town in Virginia Beach. She sent me a message that Providence Hospital reported only 19 cases of COVID. And for those of you who weren't here, a few weeks back, we had a powerful service and we were praying for the sick and we just, just began to declare that the news is gonna report how few people are in the hospital because of, with COVID. And then it's happening, amen, it's happening. And you say, yeah, but it's happening because of this and that. You know what? God is moving, praise God, and we're gonna keep speaking God's word. And so we're preaching on everything because God cares about every area of your life. He cares about your eternal salvation, 
but he, he cares about your physical well-being, your body, because you need your health to do what God's called you to do. Uh, you need, he cares about your children. He cares about your marriage. He cares about, he cares about all the things, you know, I don't know about you, but God cares about my dog. Amen. Even when I don't care about my dog. I remember when I was a kid, we had a lab and uh, he had, you know, labs have hip dysplasia and he had actually gotten hit by a car and it made it worse. And we thought we we're going to have to put him down. His hip and his leg just withered up to almost nothing. And, you know, the faith of a child, I said, Dad, can we lay hands on it and pray for it? I, I swear to you, we laid hands on the dog, prayed for it, and like a week later, the dog was using his leg. It was at full strength. Uh, and that, that really stuck out my mind as a kid that, you know what, God cares about my dog. Amen. Why? Because he cares about you and he cares about what you care about because you're his children. Amen. You're his children. You have kids and there's things that they like and you're just like, okay, whatever. I don't get it. But you like it because they like it. I grew up a basketball player, hated baseball. You might know God would give me a son who loves baseball. So I've had to learn how to love baseball. Man, that's a slow game. Sorry, Grant. That is a slow game, right? It's more fun when your kid's playing it, but otherwise, I wouldn't watch it. But I love it because, you know, Slade loves it. And, and uh, you know, Sydney and I love history, so that's just something we love anyway. But there's things that he does that we're like, all right, can you get some other interest? But, you know, he loves it, so we love it. I, I love golf, and my dad hated golf, but he played golf because I love golf. You know what? There's things in our lives that God loves every area of your life. He wants to bless you in every area of your life. And we can't act like God, we want God to touch us and we want, we want, to, we want God to use us and we want God to bless us. But this one area of money, we're going to act like we're an atheist and we don't need God to even talk about it. But you know what? The Bible talks about money more than almost every other topic combined. Why? Because you spend so much of your time in this natural world uh, dealing with money, the need of it or the lack of it or acquiring it, that, the, that our finances need to be under the lordship of Jesus Christ because he wants us to be blessed and he wants us to prosper. Amen. And so we're talking about treasure and this is a biblical perspective on money. And this is so important. Uh, Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so Jesus made this statement on, in his famous Sermon on the Mount, and he was speaking on the importance of not simply laying up treasures on earth where rusts and moth can eat away at it. He said he was making the point that you got to also store up treasures in heaven. And the point he is making is the fact to underscore that whatever you treasure in life is where your heart will be. So if you treasure the things of this world, there your heart will be. But if you treasure the things of God, there your heart will be. So we have to ask ourselves, what do we treasure? And, uh, you know, <laughs> The treasures of life determine the direction of the heart. Whatever you treasure is, is, what is, is the area that your heart will go. Solomon said to guard your heart w with all, with all uh, earnestness because out of it flow the issues of life. You know, the issues that people have today is not just because somebody did this and somebody said that. The issues that we have oftentimes or the result of our own heart and what's coming out of our heart. And that's why he said, guard it is evil, it's wicked, right? And so you better guard that heart, why? Because out of it's flowing the issues of life. And so when we treasure something in this life, our heart is gonna go in the direction of what we value and treasure, and that's gonna create an issue in our life, whether it be positive or negative. And so that's why we need to make sure we talk about money in church. You know, there's no treasure on earth that captivates the heart of man more than money. We fight wars over money, governments rise and fall over money, marriages break apart over money. We spend the bulk of our lives away from our families to gain more money. Money's required to live in this world, and they're only, these are only some of the reasons why money is such a motivation in people's lives. And you know, the thing is, is that God's not afraid to broach the subject of money because as we said earlier, this is astounding, but the Bible speaks of money more than the topic of faith 
and heaven and hell combined is because he understands that a breakthrough in the area of money will bring a breakthrough in so many other areas of our lives. And that's why we've got to make sure that we are living not just in the financial system of the world, but in God's financial system where the blessing of God can be on our lives in the area of our finances. Am I talking to anybody this morning? Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 and 20, 16, verse 24 and 25, Jesus said then to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. So Jesus was predicting his death to his disciples. And he said, look, I'm a, I am preparing to surrender my life to the will of the Father to die as a sacrifice for the sin of humanity. And so Jesus was telling them in like manner, if you're going to be my true disciples, then you're gonna have to lose your life to gain it. If you try to hold on to your life, you're gonna lose it. But if you'll go ahead and lose it for me, you're gonna gain it. Come on, somebody. You know what? I have grown up in church, and I've seen people in all walks of life and all stages and all kind of issues and all kinds of things. And I, I tell you, I've seen people try to hold on to things that they don't want to lose, and they lose it anyway. And I've seen people release to God, and they gain back so much more. What you hold on to, you lose. But what you give to God, you get, back, you get paid back in spades. You know, we say, well, I don't give to get. Well, I, you need to, because I do. Jason was saying it's more blessed to give than receive. Why did Jesus say that? Because you can't receive until you give. A farmer doesn't go out there and just wait for the corn to grow until he first goes and plants the seed. Come on, amen? And the same is true for you and me. We've got to plant the seed. We've got to give it to God, whatever it is. You know, we can't live a life where, you know, our... Money has such an attachment and is such an important thing in our lives that it's, uh, it really is, a, is the ultimate heart issue. It's a measurement of the heart like nothing else. You know, uh, how we serve God in the area of our finances says more about us than how loud would somebody might pray, how fervently they may worship, or how energetically they may serve, right? If you want to know their true heart, come on. Then, then you'll, the area of finances will determine it because that's something that we clutch onto. But you know what? If we see it as God's trying to get money from me and that preacher's up there trying to get money from me. No, we're not. We have never ever stood before you and said, we gotta keep the lights on and we need to do this and we gotta do that. And so please give. We're always, every Sunday, remind you of the promise of God that God gives seed to the sower. He said, test me and see. Amen, we're giving not off of a need, we're giving based on the promise of God that he's gonna bless, why? Why does God expect that? Because he knows that, that it's that heart issue. God so loved the world that he gave, and we never reflect God's nature more than when we give because God's a giver. You know, many people struggle with the idea, so what are we seeing Jesus saying, you gotta lay down your life to be a disciple? You gotta lay your life down, right? And if there's areas of our lives that we haven't laid down, that means that we're not a true disciple. We're a partial disciple. Do you have your ears on? That's a big 10-4, come on somebody. Life, a disciple is a, is a person who lives their life of a sacrifice. It's all for God, right? He gave his all for me, then uh, I'm in covenant with him, I give my all to Jesus. So that means that every area of our life uh, uh, is laid out as a sacrifice. It, it's open for God. And so, you know, uh, people struggle with this. Many people struggle with the idea of sacrifice because it seems like a loss. But Jesus said, if you don't, if you try to hold on to it, you're going to lose it anyway. You might as well give it up and gain the things that God's called you to gain. Jesus said, whoever lo loses their lives will find it, but whoever attempts to hold on to it will lose their life. And if we're true disciples, then we live a life of surrender that is willing to sacrifice everything to follow him, including the surrendering of our finances to his will. As we said last week in our previous message, righteous living is not small living. It's surrendered living. God wants to bless you. He's not called you to live in lack. He's just called you to live surrendered to him so that he can use you. That's it. 
That's why we were saying you shouldn't apologize. If you surrender it and you allow God to use you and you honor him with your finances and he blesses you, then come on. Don't apologize when the blessing comes back in your life. <laughs> Cain could have done what Abel did, but he was too bitter over the blessing and touch on Abel's life. And Abel, wasn't, Abel didn't say, I'm sorry, Will, it was just the thing. God just blessed me. And he didn't do that. He said, hey, you can have the same thing, but sin lies at your door. But you have the power and the authority to rule over it. Make Cain mad. And he goes out and he kills his brother. The first murder was over giving and money. Because one man was blessed and the other brother was jealous. But the other brother could have done what the one... <laughs> What his younger brother was doing, you would have thought the older brother would have been a leader in it, but his younger brother was the leader. Right? And so it's, righteous living isn't about how God's going to take everything and you've got to take a vow of poverty. That's not even biblical. Nowhere in the Bible do you see a vow of poverty. When Jesus told the rich young ruler to give everything away and follow me, it's, me, it's because the things that the rich young ruler had, they had him. See, Lord, Lord, I've done all the commandments. And he said, well, great. Well, then what can I do to be saved? Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and follow me. See, riches aren't, uh, uh, people will say riches aren't godly and you need to be poor to be holy. That's not what Jesus was saying. He was saying this young man, things had him instead of him having things and they were impediment for him to be the disciple that he needed to be. When you, when you surrender everything to God, even your finances, what, everything is a tool for the kingdom of God, and that is where you live in the blessing of the Lord. Come on, somebody. Amen? Praise God. Are you being blessed? The truth is we'll find our financial lives will be blessed when we surrender it to Jesus. Notice what King David declared when he was leading the people and presenting their offerings to the Lord. Remember, he wanted to build God a temple, but God said, you can't build me a temple because you have got blood on your hand. He was a warrior for God, and he's like, but I'm gonna have your son Solomon build me a temple. But I love David's heart. He found a loophole like a good lawyer, and he's like, I may not be able to build God a house, but I am not gonna be kept out of it. And he gathered this large offering from all the tribes of Israel, and he said, uh, uh, so that Solomon, when, when he became king, Solomon would have everything he needed needed to build the temple in advance. I love it. So he, here we are. Here he, we see David in death. He's still helping to build the temple because he had the plans drawn up. He had all the resources and the materials sitting there ready to go. All Solomon had to do was take the blueprint, get the engineers, and employ the resources that David had laid up. But he was calling on the people to give. He was giving. And he said this in 1 Chronicles 29, 12, both riches and honor come from you, Lord, and you reign over all. God reigns over everything, and he reigns over riches. And guess what? Because he reigns over riches, they're in his hand to give. He said, in your hand is power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. You know, many Christians, many Christians, in the course of their Christian life, they end up drifting in their walk of faith because uh, over, over, uh, at different seasons because of different things. Sometimes difficulties, sometimes setbacks or distractions will throw them off course. And this causes them to settle for a life of surviving rather than a life of thriving. And that's why we want to encourage you at Surge that it's a life beyond limits, but it has to be a life that's his way, not your way. You got to surrender your way to his way in order to have that, that surge, that, that increase, that rapid advancement in your life. And so as a result, many people end up, Christians unfortunately, living in this gospel of just enough. They'll say, well, Jesus was poor. Uh, he wasn't poor. Jesus didn't live a complex life, but he, he, he <laughs> because he was only going to, when, when his ministry started, he was only going to be here three years. Right? He wasn't going to be here until he was 83. He didn't need a life insurance policy. He already had it. Right, But for you and I, amen, we're going to live here longer and to be effective for the kingdom when we have resources in our hands that makes us effective. Praise God. And so uh, it's not small. Again, righteous living isn't small living. It is surrendered living. 
And so we've got to get beyond this gospel of, well, if I just have enough. Well, having enough is better than not having enough, but God is a God of breakthrough. Why do we shout and praise and, 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 and thank God for being a healer, a miracle worker, amen? Weren't you encouraged by the words today? The worship today was more declaration that, hey, dry bones can live again. Why? Because my God raises the dead. My God works miracles. My God is a God of breakthrough. Then how come we, we get weird when it becomes money? Well, I just got enough. Come on. He can raise the deadness of your financial status right now. He can cause you to burst forth and break through and increase. Why? Because riches and honor are in his hands. God is the God of breakthrough who can change your financial circumstances if you and I are willing to do it his way. You gotta stop doing it your way. Right? Do it his way. Praise God. Surrender it to his will. You know, every day when I wake up, guess what? God isn't fighting me. Now, he might be fighting me about some other things, but he ain't fighting me over money, all right? I'm tithed up, giving up, seed sowing, you know? And that's how we got to live our life. God's not wrestling with me over, over finance. It's surrendered to the Lord, right? My dad used to keep hundreds in his wallet, not just to go out and live the high life. He used to keep hundreds in his wallet because wherever he was, whenever God spoke, he'd give a hundred. He might be in Walmart and God speaks to him to give to somebody, give him a hundred, right? And when he passed and we got his things back, guess what? All those hundreds were in his wallet, and I was thinking about trying to pocket it, but my mom was there, and I felt like I should give it to her. I was like, my dad sowed a seed into me, right? and he didn't even know it. I was putting it in my pocket. No, but that's the kind of people I come from, amen? You know what COVID has done? Not only has it given permission for people to not really be connected to church anymore. I just said that. But also not to be faithful in their giving anymore. Why? Because what's happened with COVID? We sat home and we just consumed food. We ate and we ate and we ate. And guess what we also did? We ordered off Amazon and we ordered and we ordered and we ordered. And notice what's happening. It's almost like God is trying to steal. What else can, to wake us up because now there's shortages and you can't just order and order and order. Because it's stuck on a ship. <laughs> in California, we were just in Virginia Beach this week at a conference, saw a big tanker, and I was thinking, man, if those tankers in California could just go around and go through the Panama Canal, let's unload it on the East Coast. We live closer anyway, it get to us faster. But you notice, now there's shortages. Why? Because we, we, we sat at home, and we still, and it became more, even more about us then about others, and we consumed, and we consumed, and we consumed. And now it's creating, a, in two years, a pattern has now created. Well, if I go to church, if I don't go to church, if I get, I don't get, me, me. But you know what? There will be a time where there's nothing to consume. It's got, it cannot be about you. It's got to be a him, his work, his kingdom. How can he use me? How can he bless me? How can he we got to quit just being consumers all the time, and, and we got to be distributors. Amen? So in our last message, we, we, we were busting up some money myths that's prevailed far too long in the church. And, uh, and, and these things block us. They become an obstacle for biblical prosperity. Come on, I'm not talking about weirdness. I'm talking about biblical prosperity. So myth one was money's not something we should focus on, but I'm here to tell you today, yes, it is. 50% of marriages end in divorce, and 50% of those cite financial pressures. Money should be talked about. Right? The myth, myth two is God's blessings are not material. Uh, since when? When spiritual blessings materialize in this material world, what are they? What are they? Material, All right? Come on, that's myth three. The, but the Bible teaches money is evil. No, it doesn't. It says the love of money, the love of money, right? The love of money is the root of all evil. So we can't love it. We gotta, we gotta use it, not let it use us. In myth four, Jesus, Jesus modeled scarcity. No, he didn't. Again, Jesus lived simple, but it's because he wasn't going to live here long. But every time he faced lack, 
he always overcame it with increase. When he needed money to pay the temple tax, he said, Peter, go catch a fish and get the gold out of its mouth. I mean, that would be an awesome men's, <laughs> a men's fishing trip. What happened? We caught fish and we got a bunch of gold. I'm like, Lord God, let it be. You know? Uh, what else? <laughs> He fed the 5,000, there was, there was no food, took five, your God took five loaves and two fish, blessed it, broke it, 10,000 people, there was more than, there was 5,000 men, that's not counting women and children, they all ate till they were full and there were 12 baskets left over, increase, God's supernatural increase. When they ran out of wine at the, at the wedding of Cana, what happened? He made water and the wine, there was plenty of wine to go around and it was superior. It was superior to, it, to, the, to the wine that had been served before. God's a God of increase. Come on. So I want to talk about real quickly four more myths that we got to break up in our minds if we're going to have biblical prosperity in our lives. Number, number five is, myth five, God's kingdom does not need money. God's kingdom doesn't need money. It's important to understand that money isn't the thing that should rule us but we can release the kingdom of God by the correct use of money. I was telling you last week, and it's not that Kenneth Copeland needs me to defend him, but people love to hate that man, right? Because he's a man of faith and a man of signs and wonders, and he's a man who God has, he's like a modern-day Abraham the way God's blessed him, but he is the, probably the biggest giver in the history of the kingdom of God. And I'm saying that because somebody who knows him that sits on his board. If I mention the minister's name, you'd know who the minister is. I, I met him once, and I asked him about Kenneth Copeland. He said, dude's the biggest. He didn't say dude. I'm the, <laughs> the guy's the biggest giver in the history of the, of the, of the church. There's times he goes into his staff, and they're like, he's like, how much money do we have in the account? They're like, we got five million, but we got we to gotta, we gotta pay this. We got to pay the staff. Gotta, he's like, empty it all and give it to this. And, like, and, and the people are like panicked. <laughs> they're like, they start stroking out, heart attack. They're like, are you serious? But I mean, the man's blessed. And so he gave $15 million recently, and the media hits him. And when the media does pieces on him, guess what? Religious spirits get on, Christians get on social media and blast him. Some of those people haven't been in church so long, they wouldn't remember what it looked like if they walked in the door. Don't tie, don't get. He gave $15 million in the use of his own plane to help get Christians out of Afghanistan. And you say the kingdom of God doesn't need money? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Luke eleven two. 2, Jesus prayed the Lord's prayer. Lord, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, don't, he didn't say let your, let your kingdom just stay there in heaven because everything's spiritual. No, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So when the kingdom comes on earth, come on, what is that? It can't come, it's got to be supplied, amen? How will that ever take place if it's not supplied? If we don't activa activate our human abilities and responsibilities in the kingdom call, then, then we're going to miss out. In, pre in previous decades, revival teaching, it was this, that it, it taught the church that when God shows up and does, and a revival comes, that God's just gonna take care of everything. But what did that do? It caused Christians to sit back and wait on God to show up because when he showed up, he's gonna take care of everything. But that doesn't preclude you from having a responsibility that God's like, look, I've given you my spirit. I've given you the word of God. You have to partner with God, and we have to do our part so God can do his part. Amen? That's why God is pleased when we operate by faith, because he still needs faith partners in the earth for his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? The scripture teaches us that we uh, must stand in the authority of his word, and we walk in the power of the spirit, and then we, therefore we expect by faith for God to move powerfully. And so we see that Christianity is a partnership of God and us. Come on, somebody say God and us. It's a partnership. The church we're sitting in today, the outreaches we've supported this year, both at home, abroad, and the lives that are being impacted are the result of you giving money. Amen. The big part of fulfilling the ministry of God is, uh, has, has given us is through the provision of finance. We can never allow resistance to money as an agent of the kingdom of God to enter our thinking. We can't think like that. We can't think in a traditional religious spirits. We gotta be spiritual thinkers, not religious thinkers, not tradition. Come on, 
tradition. What was Jesus always up against in his ministry? The traditions of the Pharisees. You know, the Pharisees interpret the, the Old Testament through the Talmud, which is the oral traditions. And some of these oral traditions aren't accurate. They're just traditions. Jesus was always up against that. Tra- they were like, well, that's not how the, our elders did it. But Jesus is like, well, that don't mean your elders did it right. Right? He was always up against the tradition. And, some, and so we have these sacred cows in our religious thinking and in our upbringing about, about money. But we've got to switch our thinking about how God thinks about it. You know, the enemy wants to use these kinds of ideas to deceive people. Why? About money. Why? Because he wants to defund kingdom ministry. Are you guys with me? Yeah. Satan wants to defund kingdom ministry. So he wants Christians to have a hang-up about money when you talk about it in church. Amen. That's good. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. You are welcome. The fact is money says to a dream that is born of the Spirit of God, we can create a vehicle to carry you. That's what money says. It's time for all of us to lift our our commitment to see God's kingdom materialize. Ecclesiastes 10.18 says, Because of laziness, the building decays, and through idleness of hands, the house leaks. So, um, you know what? It doesn't matter if you have a key to open every lock. It's until you activate the right key for the right door, or else that door is going to be rem- remain closed, right? So God's given us the keys. We've got to take those keys, unlock the door of the kingdom on earth. Money's not a treasure that we love. It's simply a tool from God to unlock the ministry of his kingdom in the earth. Amen. We cannot buy into the myth that God will just swoop down and change everything without a revelation of the release of money. I pause for dramatic effect right there. Come on, somebody. We, we got to get past this revelation. God's just going to swoop down and take care of everything. But he can't without the release of money because that helps materi- make, bring the kingdom of God into material uh, arms and legs and feet in the, in, in the world. Amen. The kingdom of heaven is both a spiritual kingdom, but it's also a material as well. Now, myth six is that my money response is a private affair. You know, one of the ways to overcome the gospel of just enough is to overcome checkbook theology. And checkbook theology is a myth that our money is ours and it's separate from our walk with God. It's like we serve God over here and we have money over here. But you know what? Everything, we serve God with everything. The truth is our money and our faith, they're intertwined. Your money and your faith are intertwined. Uh, Randy Alcorn, he wrote this. He said, Jesus spent more time teaching on money than on heaven and hell combined. Why? Because there's a fundamental connection between our spiritual lives and how we think about and handle money. We may try and divorce our faith and our finances, but God sees them as inseparable. My goodness. Billy Graham, you probably never heard of him, but for those of you who have been living under a rock for the last 20 years, Billy Graham was a famous evangelist. I don't know if you heard about him. If you go back and, like on TikTok or Instagram, they'll play some of the old clips. Man, especially when he was younger, he is fiery, man. You're like, wow, you still feel like the anointing on those things, and he was calling people to salvation. I mean, what a, I mean, man. I mean, just Billy Graham is enough said. It's like Michael Jordan, you got it. Billy Graham, got it. Right? This is what Billy Graham said. This is not what I, I didn't make this quote up. This is Billy Graham. You know, a lot of preachers feel like you have to qu- quantify everything. <laughs> well, you know, Billy Graham said. Billy Graham said, You can tell where somebody's life is at by taking time to look at their checkbook. Boy, isn't that true? Now, I don't write many checks today. Uh, uh, you know, I have a card and I have, you know, you have Apple Pay, you have so many other things. And, and so, you know, Mary and I give on by recurring giving. That Every week, it just comes out of our account to the church. I get emails in advance every week saying, hey, you have a scheduled gift coming up. Amen. I'm scheduled to give to God. Praise the Lord. But my point is, is that I remember one year, years ago, I wrote a check to, to this is when we were Living Word Church, and I was the, this is before I was married. I remember I wrote a check to Walmart, but I, I just, I wrote, I wrote so many checks to Living Word Church. I wrote the check to Living Word Church and I handed it to the Walmart lady, and they cashed it. I'm like, how do you? It wasn't until later that I realized, oh, wait, I didn't even write that to Walmart. But Walmart is king, and the banker's going to be like, it don't matter, you're Walmart. Just cash it anyway. We know what he meant, right? I mean, come on. <laughs> but if you look in your account, it's going to tell you where your heart is. Here's the thing we've got to realize. Don't think God doesn't look in our accounts. 
He sees the heart. God doesn't judge the outward appearance. He judges the heart. And what's one of the symbols of your heart? Is your checkbook. <laughs> that is true, amen? I was liking this church until that pastor started talking about money. It's okay. It's here to, it's not to take it from you. It's to help you align up with what God wants to do in your life. And that includes me. That's why Mary and I will often share when we do a special offering, hey, this is what we're pledging. Uh, we don't say, just to let you know as a leader, I'm not asking you to do something that I'm not willing, that I'm not already doing. How could a pastor pastor a church and not even be a tither? I'm like, dude, fool, get out of here. I mean, come on. How could you, how could you, right? And, and I mean that in the name of Jesus. Yeah, I mean that in a nice way. The enemy wants to distract us or dissolve our sense of responsibility when it comes to money. He works overtime to, present, to prevent us from reaching a place where we are completely open for God to bring kingdom blessings to us and through us. Our faith and our finances aren't divorced, they're connected. The reality is God's looking at our bank statements and I want God to review my bank statement and see my heart for him and his kingdom. You know, as we said earlier, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And, and this was in a teaching about money, and he instructed people not to be like the Pharisees. They give openly, and they make this big show, and they just want to get the praise of people. And Jesus said they're hypocrites. He said, when you give, you should not let the left hand know what the right hand is doing, because a God who sees in secret will reward you openly. But people have used this to perpet per excuse me, to perpetuate a myth that money is a private thing. But the point Jesus was making in his message was not about the privacy, but about the motive of the heart. The Pharisees were being hypocritical in their giving because they sought the praise of man. And this is improper. We give not because of the praise of man. We give because we have a heart toward God and he sees it and he rewards it. Amen? You're telling me you don't reward your children when you see them doing well and being responsible? Well, why would God not feel the same way about you? When you're honoring him, he's going to honor you back because it is a partnership. It is a covenant. Abraham knew I am in covenant with God. Everything he has is mine. That means everything I have is his. When he asked, it's not even a battle or a struggle. You know, I used to ask my wife, well, what do you think we ought to give for this? And then what I felt like we ought to give was lesser than what she felt like we ought to give. And I was like, fine, I'm not going to ask you anymore. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's the last time I consult you on giving, right? But you know, I thank God that I have a wife that I don't have to fight with for us to be generous. She challenges me. We ought to give this. Now I think we ought to give this. Amen. Money is the ultimate testing ground. God knows that money, almost more than anything, constantly competes for lordship over your life. That's why last week I, I held up my, my, my wallet and my checkbook. Why? These things have to be under his lordship like everything else. So when God asks, it's not a... It's, Abraham grew to the place that he finally received the son of promise, Isaac. And then one day God said, this is the son God promised him. And he said, give me your son. Excuse me? Your only son, the son that you love. And what, can you imagine that night when God spoke to him the next morning, how he had to explain to his mother to get Isaac out? If he had said, you know what, God told me to sacrifice Isaac, so make us a lunch and we're gone. <laughs> Mama Bear would have been like, fool, I think you miss God. <laughs> right? He didn't even, but if you know, he grew to a place in his faith that God asked him for his son. He got up the next day, got everything ready, and they started journeying to where God was going to show him to sacrifice his son. But here's the thing Abraham had learned about God. God ain't asking me to give something if I don't know he's got a blessing for me on the other end. And the Bible says in Hebrews that Abraham was already believing God, that God was going to raise Isaac up from the ashes. But guess what? It was just a test of the heart because when he drew the knife back to kill his son and sacrifice him to God, God had called a ram up... A, when he was coming up this side of the mountain, a ram was coming up that side of the mountain, and a ram's horns just inexplicably get stuck in a thicket. And the angel said, hey, stop. You passed the test. There's a ram caught in the thicket. Sacrifice the ram. I know you love me. Come on. 
You say, I can't afford to tithe. I'm here to tell you today, you can't afford not to. Is this that heart, God, it's yours. Everything I have, it's yours. It's yours. You know, a lot of times parents wait to have trouble with their kids, but I'm just giving them to God. You know, we give them to God the moment they were born. They're God's to use. And we have to remind them, get up, you're gonna serve God. Come on, get up, we're going to church. You're gonna be faithful, why? Because we're, we are God's to use. You don't start that when they turn 21. You start it when they were born. You're God's to use. You're an arrow in the hands of a warrior, not just a baby to spoil. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching so good today. Thank you, Lord. I'm, not, I'm just saying, it's God's word. Come on, it's true. I'm just making the point, whether it's your kids, whether it's your money, whatever it is, you, it's, it's, it's at God's disposal. God isn't fighting me and wrestling me over because I, I got this one thing. Because you know what you'll do? You'll make it an idol. And Jesus said you can't serve two masters. You'll love the one or you'll hate the other. And so if you don't have the idols in your life, guess what? God's free to come to you and ask you for anything, anytime. And it's not because he's taking, it's because he's using you to accomplish something he wants to do. And there is gonna be a humongous reward coming on the back end of that, amen? I'm not saying you go and empty your account and give all that you have, unless God tells you to. You just, you just walk in a way that, you know what? I, my, my money's in covenant with God. I tithe, I give offerings. The, come on. And so and beyond that, anything else God tells me to do, it, I am at his disposal to do. Amen. So that's why it's the ultimate testing ground. I, I'm hurrying. Jesus said in Luke 16, therefore, if you've not been faithful with unrighteous mammon, who can trust the true riches? You know, money is one of the tests God uses. That God isn't going to, God isn't going to entrust the true riches of the kingdom to people who are, are under the yoke of money and he, he can't use them in that area, right? He said, so if you can't be faithful with one, God isn't going to entrust the true riches of the kingdom to you. Myth seven, it would be different if I had more. I could do that if I had more. What would you do if you won the lottery? You know, whenever, when, whenever people are asked that question, we said this last week, you ought to li- you ought to uh, listen to what their response. If they, if they never, I'd buy a yacht. I would buy this house. I would buy these cars. And I would do this. You know, Sydney would buy a house the size of Bruce Wayne uh, and like it's Batman and have five butlers. I'm like, dude, you already got s- one, two, three, five butlers. Your two grandmothers and all of us in the house that serve you. I mean, my God. I mean, you're pretty much all, the only thing you don't have is the, the house that Bruce Wayne has. Otherwise, you're almost there. Right? Saturdays are what he calls hibernation days. So I, I got to be at home on Saturday. And so we have to make him go out on Saturday. It's like wrestling to the ground, put clothes on him, and make sure he, you're leaving the house on Saturday. You know, there's this, we don't all live in this little perfect world where we serve you, right? But you know what? When you ask, and people ask, what would you, if you won the lottery, what would you do? If you never hear anything about giving to the kingdom work, the church, the things of God, that tells you the heart, right? And so people use this myth that if they had more money, it'd be different. If I didn't have to put kids in braces, it'd be different. But, you know, people who win the lottery, be it six million or hundred million, typically spend or lose it all within five years. And a 2008 Dutch uh, study concluded that after the initial glow of winning a fortune, within six months, people are no happier than they were before. Isn't that amazing? If I had this, I'd be so much happier. Yeah, you would for about three, four months, and then the other issues of your life would still be there. There was a U.S. Senate chaplain in the late 1940s named Dr. Peter Marshall. And this dude was slick, right? He was a chaplain. So one of the senators came up to him and, uh, one day and said, Dr. Marshall, I have a problem. And the man explained to Dr. Marshall that when he started out working, he was only making $20,000 a year. And he said it was easy to pay tithes of $2,000 on that salary. But now that he was making $500,000 a year, he could not afford to pay the $50,000 in tithe. And then Dr. Marshall thought for a minute and simply said, yes, sir, I think you do have a problem. And I think we ought to, what we ought to do is pray about it right now. Would that be okay? And then this other, this senator agreed. And then Dr. Marshall put his hand on that senator's shoulder and prayed. And he said, dear Lord, this man has a problem. I pray that you help him. Lord, I pray that you reduce his salary back to the place where he can afford to tithe. (laughs) I'm like... 
Mic drop. You know, that server was like, it's the last time I ever asked that guy to pray for me. You got to get out of this myth. Well, when my ship comes in, I get that big check. And when this thing happened, no, you got, I'm going to start where I am. Amen. People may laugh at this. Well, what Dr. Marshall's uh, testimony, uh, <laughs> but, it, but it proves a powerful point that one of God's big tests in our lives that impact all of our future is to answer, what am I going to do now with what I have been given? It's where you are right now with what you have in your hand. If you don't believe me, ask the woman, the widow of Zarephath. All she had left was a biscuit and water, but she made it available to the prophet. And her, during the whole drought, her flour of bin never ran out and her jar of oil never ran dry. She and her family were eating and they were full while other people were starving to death. We start with what's, what's in your hand right now. Amen. You just honor God with it. Genesis 8, 22, as long as the earth remains, there'll be seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night will not cease. The truth is our answers are found in the seed we possess today, not in the miracle we need tomorrow. I'm going to say it again so you can say amen. The truth is the answer is found in the seed you hold today, not in the miracle that you need tomorrow. Praise God. It's today's responses that determine tomorrow's outcome. We got to stop saying, if I had a better job, if I made more money, if the kids didn't need braces, or if my spouse uh, uh, would work a little bit longer hours. There's no better time than right now to establish the fact that what I have is God's and I'm going to honor him with where I am because I know he's not going to leave me where we are. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Myth eight, and I close with this, I'm stuck and there's no way out. So many Christians feel today that they cannot escape debt or lack. And once again, we cannot afford to allow the patterns of our past to determine our financial future. We, we've got to walk in the truth of God's word regarding money to change the way we think and live. So the, there are divine principles that unlock and release God's a provision that will enable us to overcome financial barriers. Deuteronomy 8.18. This is an amazing scripture. He said, And you will remember the Lord your God, for it's he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Did you get that? Did you just read the words that are on that screen or on that Bible before you? That is a powerful verse. He said, I am the Lord your God, and I'm going to give you the power to get wealth. But you better remember me. You know how it is when we need, we reach out to God and we pray and we cry. But then when it's when the pressure lets up and we got some money and we got our bills paid and everything's in the we, it's amazing how we start slipping and get into complacency. But you know what? Whether I'm in lack or I'm in, I'm in abundance, I know that God's going to empower me. Come on. But Paul said, I've abounded and, I've, and, and I have been abased. I have prospered and I've been in lack, but I know that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. me and no matter the circumstance I find myself in, it's all God's anyway. And he's going to use me and he's going to bless me. He's going to get me through this season. Amen. So we should not be waiting for wealth to show up in the mail or show up in our bank account. That doesn't mean God can't do things like that, but that isn't, you know, you're not gonna go out to your mailbox every day. Oh man, I got this check from heaven. Right? The government's not my source. God's my source, but I do it his way. He said, I'm, gonna give you, I'm not giving you wealth, I'm giving you the power to get wealth. Are you guys, did you hear the words that came out of my mouth right there? I'm not just throwing money at you. I heard this comedian say when he was an Italian comedian, and he said he grew up with an immigrant. His parents were straight from Italy. His dad was from Sicily. His grandfather was from Sicily. He never even spoke English, his grandfather, his whole life. Lived here, lived out the rest of his years in America, never spoke English. He said, but, I mean, they just you work, you know, to make it. And he's like, I remember I was eight years old watching cartoons one Saturday. My dad's like, come on, get up, get a job, start a business. He's like, now? <laughs> You're eight, come on, start a business. Right, the problem is, we have consumed and consumed and consumed and consumed. We've taught our children to consume and consume and consume instead of create, 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 create. We don't make anything anymore, and so we're dependent upon other countries to. We consume it, they make it. Now we're in a pinch where we can't consume it, and we're. 
We gotta create. We gotta create wealth. He give you the power. But he says, but when I give you the power to do it, don't forget me. Honor him. Like when you're making 20,000, 30,000, it's easy to pay tithes on that. But when God makes you wealthy, where's your heart? You're gonna still tithe and give and sow? You should do more, amen? Why? Because he's given you a channel to supply in the, in the kingdom of God. So we should be not be waiting for wealth to show up. We gotta, we gotta, we've got to uh, 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 ask God, Lord, help me create a pathway to create wealth and release financial blessings. God helps us create channels of wealth and income, and, that, uh, uh, and we will be empowered to re- release uh, resources and blessing into the kingdom. So if you run a business, you gotta realize, I'm a steward of this business. This business has to also be available to channel blessings into the kingdom of God. Amen? Come on. So we want to see Christians see their jobs not as a source of income, but as a source of seed. When you look in the Scripture of the New Testament, that's why I'm so, I'm so disturbed by the socialism that's trying to take over our country. We've got to pray against it, speak against it, stand against it. Why? Because they want you to sit home and, and just get some money. But God said, now what was the first thing God gave Adam? A job. Why? Because in your job, there's a productivity, there's creativity that you release. You can't just get that sitting at the house collecting a check, watching TV. By laziness, the house will decay. And by laziness, the house of a nation will fall apart and decay. Because there will be, be a time when there's not enough money to send out those checks. And then people are going to get upset, where's my money? Right? You don't have to say amen, but it's true. It is good. But here's the thing. We've got, to, we, we, we've got to get up and let's work and create it. Praise God. Teach our children. Let's think of ideas and ways. Praise the Lord. Amen. Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8 says this. Let me, I was going to say this. In the New Testament, what did, what did Paul say? He said, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. But, but then he said, work that you may have something to what? Spend were that you may have something to give. You can go back and Google it if you don't trust me. <laughs> That's what he said. Work. So my, I have to even change the way I think about my job. I'm getting up, make money, pay but No, I'm working. I'm getting seed today. You got to start changing the way you think. I'm working. That's my money. No, everything I have is God's. I'm working to have something to give. And that's how the blessings start flowing out. We just, it's changing the way we think, amen? It's creating new paradigms biblically about money. I promise you, I'm closing with this. Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, for he will be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river. Does that sound like lack and defeat? No. He said he will not fear when he comes, but its leaf will be green and it will not be anxious in the year of drought nor will cease from yielding fruit. Thank you, God. In spite of economic drought, we're going to prosper. Come on, somebody. Why? Because of what God promised us. Because I'm in covenant with God in every area, including my finances. Praise God. Between the promise and the provision is our responsibility. I'm going to say it again. Between the promise and the provision is our responsibility. John Calvin, the famous... Reformation voice said, where riches hold the dominion of the heart, God has lost his authority. Amen? If we're going to submit to the authority of God, that means we're submitting, to, we're submitting to every, his authority reigns over every area of our lives. Amen? Every area. Praise God. I hope you were blessed today. Amen. Amen. These are important conversations to have. Why are you talking about money? Well, because what are you going to be doing tomorrow? You got to get up early. And go work. Why? For money. Amen? So instead of just working and striving under the world's system of what Jesus called the mammon system, let's, let's, while we're working in this mammon system, we're not of this world. Right? And we're a part of a different economy. That is the economy of heaven. That's the God who causes uh, uh, the springs of water to spring forth in the wilderness. He's the God who called Isaac and he sowed in the year of famine and he reaped a 100-fold return. Are you guys hearing me? In the year of famine. Do you know how crazy faith you have to have to get out there and dry parched ground when it hadn't rained and you know it's not going to rain and you stick a seed in that ground thinking, oh my God. And it 
Not only came up, but it came up with great abundance and he reaped a 100. That's crazy. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that God calls manna to fall from heaven? Do you believe that? Do you believe that he calls an ax head to float to cancel a debt? Do you believe that God, Jesus said, go catch a fish and there will be enough gold to pay my tax? Jesus had to pay tax. My tax and your taxes. Do you believe that? Well, then can't he bless you too? I mean, yes. Let's stand on our feet. Come on, give him praise. He can bless you too. And he wants to bless you. It's not he can, he wants to. But it's not just a random blessing. It's operating in his system, operating in he, how he does, operating in the way the Bible tells us to do it. Praise God. Father, I thank you right now. Come on, as a sign of surrender, just if you don't mind, lift up your hands to God and say, Lord, I just surrender all. I surrender all. You know, a lot of us back in the day, speaking of those Billy Graham crusades, they would sing that song, I surrender all when people would come to the altar to give their heart to God. But surrendering all is surrendering all. I surrender me, my future, my life, my marriage, my everything, my money, my house, I mean, everything I have, I'm surrendering it. Because if he can't be your Lord, then he can't be your Savior. But here's the thing, when you're under his authority, you see, here's, we gotta realize, Satan has some power, he has power, but what he doesn't have is authority. That's so good right there. He's got power, but he doesn't have the authority. That's why when Michael wrestled over the, over, with Lucifer over the body of Moses, Michael, the archangel, said, told, told Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Why? Because Satan's got the power. He's a god of this world, but he doesn't have the authority. And so Michael was invoking a higher authority over Satan to gain Moses' body. And God said, if you'll test me now in this and bring all your tithes into the storehouse, see that I'll not rebuke the devourer for your sake. The devourer has power, but when you invoke God, he doesn't have authority. And when the Lord of hosts comes to his covenant people's homes, he rebukes the devourer with that same authority, the authority that Jesus used to drive out demons, the authority that Jesus raised the dead with, the authority that Jesus worked miracles with, the authority that he spoke with is the same authority when he commands the blessing of God on his people. It's that authority. And when that authority enters your life as a tither and as a giver and as a person in covenant with God, what happens? That devourer's got to take his hands off your life. That devourer has to take his hands off that business. That devourer has to take his hands off that career. Got to take his hands off my kids. Come on. Come on. Amen. Got to take his hands off my marriage. Praise God. He's got to take his hands off my car. Amen. It's that authority. So when you're giving today, when you're giving, come on, realize, well, I'm just giving, I'm being blessed. No. I'm giving as a covenant partner with God, and that's releasing the authority of God in my life to rebuke the devourer. Come on, somebody. I just feel a word on that right now. In the name of Jesus. Come on. Come on. Praise him with some authority right now. Thank him with some authority right now. God, I thank you that at my house, come on, at my house, the devourer is rebuked in the name of Jesus. The devourer is rebuked in the name of Get your hands off. My family, get your hands off. Come on. You will not take from me. You will not devour from me. Thank you, Lord God. I'm blessed to be a blessing. Everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. God, use me. Speak to me. Let me be a channel. Come on now. It's easy to say, yes, amen. Praise God. But tomorrow, be open to what God might tell you to do. Be open to what he might tell you to do. He has a crazy way of saying, hey, give me your son, your only son. I heard the story of a pastor one time. This, he wanted this certain leather jacket. It was a three-quarter. It was so cool. It was very expensive. Somebody gave it to him. And he was so excited, man. He said, I was on a flight, and I was wearing that jacket. And he saw this guy, and he laid the jacket on the... <laughs> and he heard God say, give him that jacket. He's like, God, this is my jacket, my only jacket, the jacket that I love. <laughs> you know, he wrestled with God the whole flight. When he got off that flight, he handed the jacket to that guy, leather coat to that guy, because God told him to give it. You know what? 
when God's just taking stuff. No, he's not. He's setting him up for a bigger blessing because there's more to it than a leather coat. And just a leather coat. That God, I'm a channel. Whatever it is, you're going to use me. Amen? Praise God. Are you blessed today? And if you're here today and you've never prayed to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're watching online, we pray God's blessings, that same anointing that's in this service to be extended to you. And if you're here today and uh, you're watching online and you've never prayed to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, just pray this simple prayer with me. Just say, Heavenly Father, I believe that you sent your son Jesus. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life and he died on a cross for my sins. He was buried, and you raised him on the third day. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I submit my life to your lordship, and I ask you to come into my heart and save me and make me new. And I commit to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that simple prayer in faith today, would you lift up your hand and let us recognize you? Uh, if you're watching online and you prayed that prayer for the first time, please log on to our website at surgechurch.tv or our church app and fill out the I Made a Decision page on that form. We want to get with you and connect with you and be a blessing to your spiritual life as you grow as a disciple of Jesus. Amen. We pray you were blessed by the worship and ministry of our Surge experience today. It is our desire to see people experience a surge of God's power and grace that will empower them to live life beyond their limits. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for sharing the ministry of Surge Church with your friends and family and on social media. We love you and cannot wait to see you soon.